So um, I will talk about systems of particles where one cares about interactions that are beyond bounder, uh, binary, so binary and higher orders. And uh, briefly, I will just, uh, this, this is related to two groups of joint works. One is with Thomas Chan on quantum systems, and the other group is with Joachim Ampatsoglu, who, and that's on uh, uh, classical systems. Okay, so let's see, let's move. So at the beginning, we will talk about quantum systems just a little bit. And uh, because that's how we got into this story. Um, and then we will move to talk about classical systems of particles and see what happens with them when you go beyond bound, uh, binary interactions. So first we will recall in that context, effective equation. So what's the common denominator for both of these topics is that nonlinear PDE arises as an effective equation in this process. And uh, in the case of classical systems, that's Boltzmann equation, if one looks at the binary interactions only. But if we go beyond, if we look at the ternary, we will talk about this derivation of the ternary Boltzmann equation. And uh, I hope at the end to have a little bit of time to, to introduce this new work where we uh, rigorously derive binary ternary Boltzmann equation. Okay, so let's see. So first quantum picture. So at very low temperature, so why do we care about effective equations? Of course, we love them as PD people, we analyze them, we care about their well-posedness and so on. But why are they relevant from a physical point of view? One view to look at that is related to some sort of averaging behavior of systems of Bart particles that can be modeled using effective equations. So in the quantum system, so here is an example of a very famous phenomenon, Bose-Einstein condensation. So at very low temperatures, as we know, dilute Bose gases are characterized by microscopic occupancy of a single one particle state. So that's known as Bose-Einstein condensation. So this phenomenon goes to the beginning of quantum mechanics to 1920s. Bose was the first one to suspect that. And he talked with Einstein. I think he sent a paper to Einstein and they developed uh, the theory. Uh, however, it took quite some time until first experiments happened. So that was in 1995. So there were two teams, a Cornell, uh, one led by Cornell and Wieman at the University of Colorado Boulder, and the other one at Caterla, uh, at MIT led by Caterla. And also there was a team at Rice, as far as I know. So that's 95. So that's quite some time. I'll tell you a little bit about those experiments. And of course, that motivated mathematicians to look into the problem. And the first challenge is how do you formulate the problem? And then, of course, how do you rigorously prove it? So around 2000, Lieb, Siringer, Yingwenson, and uh, their friends and collaborators worked on that a lot in the static case, no time evolution. And recently, this line of work was revisited by people. There are quite a few teams, Nam, Rougeri, Siringer, as well as Boccato, Brenek, Etzena, Timpempo, and Schlein. These types of works that I'm putting here are static in time. There is a lot of activity where one looks at the dynamics, and I will talk about that too. But first, let's go to these experiments. So this is Bose Einstein condensation in pictures. So uh, velocity, this, so the experiments go, but you, you look at atomic gases and you trap, people trap them with magnetic forces and cool them to very low temperatures. And then they turn off magnetic traps and see what's happening. And they see that the gas evolves as one particle. So this is this effective behavior when you notice behavior of one particle. So here's a picture of velocity distribution data of a gas of rubidium atoms before and just after the condensation and sometime later, okay? So you might, I like actually this picture and I try to show it because it captures the idea. So this is what was on the cover of Science Magazine in 95, after the first experiment, in December of 95, when the first experiments happened. You have this army of particles and they all, be, they all do on average the same thing, okay? So how would you go about that mathematically? So one way to look at that, so this is really like this picture has three vertical, three columns. This is first, second, third. So you look at the N particles. And in case of quantum particle, of course, uh, Xi's represent positions, but in case of quantum particles, only with a certain probability, you know, particle is uh, at, the pro pro at the certain position. So, but imagine like now they are fixed, they are 
the classical system, for example. So there are n particles, and you would like to capture their behavior. So one way to look at that is you look at the energy for the system of n particles, and you want to understand energy per particle. So you look at the energy of the entire system divided by number of particles, and then you look at the limit as n goes to infinity. So for a moment, you think, of course, we as mathematicians are trying to make our life harder. So why would one look at the infinitely many particles? It, you, one might think that finitely many is easier, but one, one notices, notices when one look, looks at this limit that this actually what one obtains is related to the energy of one particle and specifically one particle that evolves according to the, in case of the quantum picture, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, okay? So that's the connection with, with PDE. So um, let me tell you, let, let's just discuss a little bit more this uh, uh, sort of picture from finitely many to infinitely many to one and why one does that. So specifically in the case of quantum systems, um, so one looks at the, why would you want to look at the limits? So if I go back to the n particles, the situation is these, you put on the system of n particles certain Hamiltonian, let's call it Hn. And on purpose, I'm actually not writing the formula here. So imagine that it has a kinetic part and it has a maybe, inter, in, uh, maybe some external potential so that you get, we have a trap and also interactive potential, how particles interact. And then you look at the wave function of the system and it evolves according to the linear Schrodinger equation. So what is important to uh, point out that this is linear. Uh, I started to draw without intention, okay? So this is, um, this is a linear system and uh, therefore there is an HN is a self-adjoint operator. So there's global well Poznan. So you might say, okay, end of the story, you know that there are solutions. However, people care about such a system that n is huge. So we are talking like in the case of stars, 10 to the 30. So the fact that we can write a nice formula for the solution is completely useless. And from a numerical point of view, it's just nothing can, can be done. So fortunately, physicists care about averaging behavior of those particles, not about what each particle does at certain moment. And taking the limit as n goes to infinity is a way to capture that averaging behavior, okay? So how is that done? I'm not going to read. There are many people working in this area and have been working in this area. So I just want to point out directions. So there are many approaches actually. In the quantum systems, there are quite a few approaches and that's beauty of this. So uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, the first approach was actually based on quantum field theory and the second quantization. And HAP was the first one who noticed connection between many particle systems and a nonlinear heart tree equation, okay? Uh, uh, then there was another way by proving convergence, and that's more like in math physics uh, sp spirit, and that was done by Spohn. So these two were revisited relatively recently, last 10 to 15 years, and there is a quantum field theory approach that has been revived, many people working there, and then math physics approach has been revived uh, by, again, many authors, and also dispersive PDE people got into the picture. Um, and that's, I think, thanks to Kleinerman and Makedon who um, noticed how one can, use, also in, in the work at the Schlein Yao, it was visible, the importance of the tools from the nonlinear PDE. But uh, somehow this idea of using dispersive PDE is, can be formulated. If you go back to this picture, there is a one particle evolves according to the nonlinear Schrodinger or nonlinear Hartree equation. And in the last few de couple of decades, there was amazing progress on understanding solutions of such equation. So then can one, if you want to derive that equation, expectation is that you want to use some of those tools. Some of those tools should be helpful and some of those ideas can guide the process of derivation. So that's what's happening with somehow using PDE tools in conjunction with math physics tools. But I, I don't want to go into details of that. What I want to talk about, what happens if you look at the situations where you go beyond bound uh, binary interactions. So when I was preparing this talk, I was counting years. So this, kept, this happened actually quite some time ago. That's how Thomas Chan, my colleague here, and I started collaborating. We wondered when you have a quantum system of particles, what happens if you put a potential that allows three particles to interact, okay? And I'll tell you what our motivation was at the time. So um, 
And before that, people looked at both gases with pair interactions, more or less, which is natural in the absence of interactions with any external field. However, in physics, when one wants to incorporate and one want to look, wants to look at both gas with the background field of matter included in the picture, so then actually what's relevant, for instance, phonons or photons, so then averaging over later will typically lead to a linear combination of affective and particle interactions. So not just three particle interactions or four, but the linear and so on, but linear combination of those. And uh, uh, so that's physical motivation and math. We were, at the time, we were motivated by math because many of our friends have been studied a uh, quintic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And quintic nonlinear Schrodinger is energy critical in 3D or for example, mass critical in 1D. And uh, there were inspiring important works like for example, I-Team in 2008 or Dodson uh, relatively recently in the case of the mass critical 1D. So quintic analysis has been studied a lot uh, um, on their own. Uh, so we wanted to see, can we derive that equation? Okay. So, um, I just want to tell you what's the starting point of this derivation, and then I want to switch to classic, talk about classical systems of particles. So the starting system is a point of, is you will look at the N bosons, whose dynamics is generated by this Hamiltonian written in 1.1, okay? So Hamiltonian, so this is happening, I'll tell in a moment about Hamiltonian, this is happening on the Hilbert space of L2 functions. So there are D particle, sorry, there are N particles in RD, so it's happening in RDN. So L2 with the symmetric means that elements are wave functions that are fully symmetric with respect to permutations of arguments xj. This is related to the fact that one is modeling bosons as opposed to, for example, fermions. So going back to Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian has kinetic parts, so with this kinetic energy, there is some of Laplacians for all those particles. And then there is a potential. So to get quintic, we needed to introduce three particle potential, which mean, means how, which is translation invariant in our case, and it tells us how particles i, j, and k interact. There is a scaling because you want to make sure that you have energy, that it makes sense, so you need to rescale this term. Sorry, this is a um, joy of giving talks in my son's room. Sorry, I really look forward to coming physically to conferences. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. He, need, he needed to get a toy. <laughs> okay, so going back to the talk. Um, sorry, so this is Hamiltonian that one looks at and the starting point of this uh, investigation. So then one looks at the limit as then goes to infinity and so on. So uh, what I want to emphasize in in the, and you will see that in contrast with respect to classical systems. So here we are putting potential and potential, potential helps us mimic what's happening. Okay, so the way how it's done is you look at the n body Schrodinger equation with that Hamiltonian. So then you look at the limit as n goes to infinity. So you get this infinite equation, infinite hierarchy of equations, which is called gross pitayevsky hierarchy. So the step one is convergence as n goes to infinity. However, step two, Two is much, much harder. You want to prove uniqueness in the quantum case, uniqueness of the solutions to this infinite hierarchy of equations. And uh, uh, why? Because there is a special, there is ansatz. You plug, a, you, if you plug a special ansatz here, you see that there is a, this gross pitevsky hierarchy admits special factorized solutions with each factor solving NLS. So if you want to derive NLS, you better prove uniqueness of the solutions because that means there is only one thing that's going to come out and that's NLS. So this specific way to approach the problem has been done rigorously in the case of the cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation by Erdoslein and Yao. So subsequently, there are many other works revisiting uniqueness. I mentioned Kleinerman, Makedon, we also with Thomas and collaborators, we had some other works on that, but I'll not talk about it. This is, I just wanted to give you a flavor, okay? So this was basically all I wanted to say about quantum systems. It was this physical motivation to study three particle interactions and higher, and also um, mathematical. And I want to uh, uh, also wrap up this by saying, if we go back to physical question, linear combination of affective and particle interactions with n going from being two, three, all the k, led to derivation of the NLS with the linear combination of power nonlinearities. And this was the work of my student, Jihu Ishii in 2015. Okay. So now uh, classical systems. So first let's talk about Boltzmann equation itself a little bit, and then we will talk about modifying it. 
So uh, Boltzmann equation was introduced by Maxwell in Boltzmann in late 1816 and early 1870s. And this is a, considered a model that describes the dynamics of a dilute gas. So here is the equation. So that's delta T, partial T with respect to F plus V dot gradient of F and then Q2. So here, this is for the position X in RD in general time, you, often the most important is R3, time T, which is positive in R plus and velocity here, V stands for the velocity, okay? So this describes evolution of the density at X, T and V of gas particles. So if you look at the left-hand side, that's trans transport equation, okay? So what's happening on the right-hand side? So on the right-hand side, it's Q2, that's quadratic integral operator that expresses change of F due to instantaneous binary collisions, so just binary collisions. And the exact form of Q2 depends on the type of interaction between particles. So I like sort of to keep, to show this slide first. I'm newcomer to Boltzmann equation, thanks to, in, very much thanks to my colleague Irene Gamba, who is expert on Boltzmann equation. So, but I like to start writing it like this because at the beginning I was very scared of this operator, perhaps with a reason. It is a scary operator, as you will see in a moment. So it mimics how particles collide, okay? So, um, so let's talk a little bit more about Q2. So I have a picture here. So if for a pair of particles, let V prime and V prime star be their pre-collisional velocities. Then one can form a relative pre-collisional velocity vector. So that's U prime. Uh, and also you can make a unit vector that's sigma. So then uh, after collision, these particles will have velocity V and V star. So here they are. And you can form also so post-collisional relative velocity vector. So then what is relevant is actually this angle theta. So if you had and sigma are uh, relevant unit vectors, so what's relevant in the picture is angle theta between uh, relative pre-collisional and post-collisional velocities, at least in one way to describe the equation. So for elastic interactions, momentum and energy are conserved. So here's the first equation is conservation of momentum. The second equation is conservation of energy. So one can actually solve this system. One can calculate pre-collisional velocities in terms of post-collisional velocities and sigma. So then it, if we want to go back to Q2, what is Q2? So what's happening in Q2, so those are binary interactions. You have F, so here we use notation when we put F prime, if the velocity is, is if it's evaluated at V prime, well, we put F prime star if it's evaluated at V prime star, okay? So there is this gain minus loss, the quadratic term in terms of F, and then there is a kernel B that depends if you look at it on magnitude of U and the angle between U and sigma. So again, U is the relative post-collisional vector and uh, here it is, and uh, uh, theta is the angle between um, these two and sigma is the other uh, relative pre-collisional vector, okay? So what happens if you integrate sigma and if you integrate dv star, you get something that's function of x, t, and v and the operator q acting on f, okay? So now you might wonder still, we didn't say much about B. So that's where differences appear. So in relevant physics, there are various ways of rep representing V, but in relevant physical applications, one often has something like 2.3, where you have magnitude of absolute value of A, and then you have B depends on the cosine of theta. So now depends what's happening with power A. If A is negative, if A is between minus D and zero, this corresponds to soft potential case, okay? If A is zero, that's a specially nice case of maximal molecules. Why is it nice? The things are simplified. Some, some things are simplified. Some calculations are simplified for the equation itself. And there is a machinery uh, developed by Bobby Lab on using Fourier, on exploiting Fourier transfer methods. Okay. And then when A is between zero and one, this is the case of so-called variable hard potentials with A being one is the hard sphere case. Okay, like billiard ball, hard, hard sphere. Okay, so uh, Boltzmann itself, as we saw, uh, talks about binary, in, equation talks about binary interactions among particles. So uh, ternary or higher order collisions, meaning more than two particles are being in simultaneous contact, are neglected due to lower probability of occurring compared to binary. So actually when one derives a Boltzmann equation from um, many body systems, one shows that there is a lower probability of getting all the others, so they're not relevant. 
However, if the gas is dense enough, higher order interactions are much more likely to happen. So therefore they produce a significant effect to the evolution equation. And this is the scenario that we want to analyze and we want to study, okay? So taking higher order interactions uh, into account. An example of such a situation is colloid, which is a homogeneous non-crystalline substance consisting of either large molecules or ultramicroscopic particles of one substance dispersed through a second substance, various gels, milk, things like that, okay? So there were various papers in physics around 2002, and specifically the one that we want to point out now is by Roos, Bonn, and Von Gutberg uh, that talks about interactions among actually higher order particles, but they analyze numerically three particle interactions. And then they say that in that case, the three particle, inter the three particle interactions actually significantly contribute to the grand potential um, of a colloidal gas. So they, they are saying that in a colloidal gas, higher order interactions are relevant. And it's actually interesting how they model three particle interactions. So what they are saying a bit surprising and important in our view result from this paper is that interactions among three particles actually depend on the sum of distances between particles as opposed to different geometric configurations. Because if you think about geometry, you can get various things, but instead they're saying, do not pay attention to geometry in this case, just pay attention to sum of distances. So at least that's one way to look into that. And we were motivated by what they were saying in that paper. Okay. So I want to tell you a little bit about this program that we have with Joachim Ambatsoglu. So Joachim was my graduate student. He just graduated this summer and he's now postdoc at Courant. So motivated by what we just mentioned, we wanted to see if uh, we can rigorously derive from a system of classical particles, the kinetic model, which goes beyond bound uh, uh, binary interactions. So our goal is to incorporate the sum of higher order interactions into Boltzmann equation. So our goal is to derive something that looks like 2.4. So if we look at that, so we have transport on the left, delta TF plus V dot gradient F. And on the right hand side, there is a sum K going from two to M of QKs. So QK is the K to order collisional operator. And M going all the way up to M is accuracy of the approximation depending on the density of the gas. So when M is equal to two, that's just Boltzmann equation. M is equal to three, one that considers both binary and ternary interactions and so on. So I want to point out that uh, after we have already started this, uh, we realized that, that Irene Gamba and her collaborators, so precisely Bobilev Gamba and Cercigliani, have considered the system of the type 2.4, but for Maxwell molecules. So they used actually Fourier transform methods to study well poseness, global behavior, and so on of the system of the type 2.4 in the case when the, we are talking about Maxwell molecules. As opposed to that, Joachim and I are studying hard sphere, hard spheres. Okay, so, um, so the case, let me just go back now. So what I'm saying is not only that we want to study this equation, we would like to derive this equation from classical many particle system. So one might ask what's happening even for the case M is equal to two, which is Boltzmann equation. In other words, what is known about derivation of the binary Boltzmann equation? And uh, this task of rigorously deriving equation for M is equal to two itself is a challenging problem. And there are open questions right now. So this was described, Hilbert described this in the list of the problems. And this is famous, his famous sixth problem is one of the main challenges of the mathematician, for mathematicians of the, of the 20th century. So here we are in the 21st and this still, there are open questions related to this problem. So for hard sphere interactions, the analysis was pioneered in 1975 by Landford. And this was recently completed and, uh, by Gallagher, saint Ramon, and Texier, and there's entire, many of their collaborators who are working on questions of that type and making it more physical. And uh, also there are, for short range potentials, I want to point out the analysis has been done. And again, there are many people I'm just mentioning here, King, starting from King in 1975, then Gallagher, saint Ramon, Texier in 2012, as well as Paul Viranti, Safirio, Simonella in 2014. But there are many works along these lines. I'm not mentioning uh, them now uh, because I want to focus on higher order interactions. So now what about M is equal to three? So what does M is equal to three mean? That's 
Some mean some k goes from two to three, so it will have a binary and ternary interactions. So in addition to understanding binary interactions, that requires in understanding interactions among three particles and then careful, careful analysis of their mutual interactions. So at the end of the talk, I will actually talk about this case because this is something that Joachim and I just finished during the summer. Uh, but for now, first I want to talk about the case when you have just ternary interactions, okay? So derivation of ternary Boltzmann equation. So now we focus on rigorously deriving a purely ternary equation. And this is so in order to get closer to eventually look at the linear combination, which itself brings a lot of challenges uh, due to combinatorial and configurational intricacies. So let me talk about some of those challenges first. So first challenge is how to make sense of ternary interactions so that we can detect their contributions, okay? because if we are in the same setting as binary, they are going to be of the lower probability and they will not be seen, okay? So what do we mean by ternary interaction, okay? So in words, we, in a typical dilute hard sphere gas, the probability, imagine like three hard spheres, the probability of simultaneous contact of three hard spheres, so that all, that you have two, Every single, that all of them are touching is very small compared to, for example, a situation when one of the three particles is in simultaneous contact with the other two particles, okay? That, and together, that motivated us together with the results from the paper that I mentioned, physics paper, Roos von Gunberg, that uh, where they say that interactions among three particles are determined by the sum of the distances of interacting particles. So motivation from the sum and from this, fact above that I mentioned is that we want to mimic interactions of three part particles based on non-symmetric version of a ternary distance. Non-symmetric because there will be one particle that somehow, uh, uh, that we are going to, central particle, let's call it for the moment, okay? So uh, ternary interactions, mat, mat formulations. First, what do we mean by ternary distance, this asymmetric version? So distance between x1 and 2 and 3, those are uh, positions of three particles, is going to be the distance between one and two. So square root of the, uh, we have distance between sum of the x1 minus x2 squared and x1 minus x3 squared. So having defined ternary distance, we can talk about ternary interaction, okay? And let's fix epsilon, let's, uh, let's consider epsilon positive and consider three particles, i, j, k. And uh, they have positions and velocities x, x, i, v, i, x, j, v, j, and x, k, v, k in R2D. So we say that the particles i, j, k are in i, j, k ternary interaction of the ternary epsilon interaction or zone epsilon if the square of the distance defined above is two epsilon squared. So I'm measuring the distance between these particles and this interaction zone, we call that epsilon, okay? So once we define, so let's imagine that that's, that's what we mean by interaction. So then you can ask what's happening in order to understand the collision of the particles, you want to see if you have three particles before the interaction, after interaction, what's happening with their velocities. So and finite system of particles. So consider I, J, K, ternary epsilon interaction. So that's equation 2.7. So let us denote by stars, so V, I star, V, J star, and V, K star, velocities of the interacting particles after the interaction, okay? And assume that uh, the, the mass is one, so it's not relevant in this picture at least. And we consider interactions to be elastic. So there is a conservation of momentum. So that's equation 2.8. And then there is conservation of energy. That's, uh, that's 2.9, okay? So now let's revisit 2.7. So let's just divide everything by two epsilon squared. And then the object that appears on the left, the square of that object, so object we will call W1, sorry, omega one tilde. So omega one tilde is xj minus xi divided by square root of two epsilon. And then omega two tilde is xk minus xi divided by square root of two epsilon. So what you, if we introduce this omega one and omega two tilde, so then we see that 2.7 is nothing but the information that omega one and omega two are on the sphere. In other words, omega one tilde squared absolute value plus square of the absolute value of omega two is one. So these omega one and omega two, we call them impact directions, uh, impact directions of the interaction, okay? So uh, now you want to, what do we want to do? We want to get the formula for the stars. So you really want to solve the system 2.8, 2.9. So to define what we mean by 
transformation of the velocities. So how do we know that there is unique solution to the system 2.8 to 2.9? So this is again, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. So we impose an extra condition. Since particle I interacts with JK, we assume that velocities JK are transformed with respect to impact directions into velocities VJ star and VK star and for some constant C. So we impose 2.11. And this is not, by the way, in the derivation of the Boltzmann equation, the regular binary, there is exactly assumption of that type. So under this assumption, of course, it's just you have one it's not a vector, it's just, uh, it, 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 you have it only for the, for the VJs, there is no VK, okay? So uh, once we add this condition 2.11, we can solve system 2.8, 2.9, there's unique solution. And I will spare us of the formula, but that's actually, there is explicit formula, and that gives us, we will call that transformation of velocities. So that's when particles interact in the sense of epsilon internal interaction, their velocities change, and we get the formula for the change by solving that system. Okay, so now we can define phase space. And the phase space for D in N, D greater or equal than two, uh, the phase space of N, and then is number of particles. The phase space of N particle system of epsilon interaction zone is defined to be set of Zn, Zn. So that's positions, Xn is a vector that decodes positions of all N particles. And Vn is a vector that decodes velocities of N particles. So you look at the positions and velocities and such that the distance, the ternary distance of ijk, the square of the distance is greater than or equal than two epsilon squared. And this is for all ijk and in, and in is the set of the triples such that we order them. This is just combinatorial help. Uh, by the way, um, I'll just comment, this is what we, what we work because that's the simplest, there is this special particle i and then we evolve the situation. So one can actually look at the all permutations of i, j, k and define the corresponding space d tilde correspond to set of all permutations so that you lose asymmetry, that you sum over all possibilities, that you have symmetric distance, and then one can derive cousin of the equation that we are deriving. And the cousin is actually quite nice from the analysis of the well-posedness of the cousin. But this specific one is also good for the, for the derivation because we, we see things in a simpler way from the combinatorial point of view. This is just a little comment, okay? So now evolution of the system of n particles. Remember what our goal is. We have n particles. We want to, we want to look at their evolution and eventually we want to look at limit as then goes to infinity. So how do these particles evolve? So consider initial configuration Zn in this phase space. So the rule of the game is particles are assumed to perform rectilinear motion as long as there is no interaction. Okay, so just they move, okay, linearly. Uh, assume now that an initial configuration Zn has evolved until time t, reaching Zn of t. And assume that there is an ijk interaction at time t. So then what is happening at that time? Velocities vi, vj, vk are instantaneously transformed into the velocities vi star, vj star, vk star. So that's the system for n particles. You have one and two, okay? So then the first question is, challenge number two is, you need to understand global dynamics of this system of n particles. So it's not obvious that the system that I said rectally in our motion until the interaction, after the interaction, change of velocities. That, that this produces a well-defined dynamics since evolution is not smooth in time and the system can possibly run into pathological configurations. So by the way, in the case of the binary interactions, that was work of Alexander, very important work that's used in subsequent works now also of Lanford, but also of Gallagher, San Ramon and their collaborators. So Alexander established global well-defined dynamics for the binary interactions. This was his thesis. So we had to do analog of that for ternary interactions because nobody considered ternary interactions. So indeed we can prove global in time dynamics of n particles. And there is a crucial observation in order to go from local, in, local is easy, to go from local in time to global, there is this crucial observation that if a triplet of particles was in the interaction, then as the system evolves in time, the subsequent interaction cannot involve the same triplet of particles, okay? So thanks to this, we can prove global, well -poses, global uh, dynamics for the n particle system. So therefore, there is a Liouville equation. So global measure preserving interaction flow yields the Liouville equation. Now I want to 
think, so one way to think about label equations, there is a transport for all these particles. So if you look at delta TF, so there is a transport really in the interior of the phase space. At the boundary of the phase space, so what's happening, so at the time, so at uh, what's happening that F of T of Z then, if that's really a collision at the boundary when the distance is two epsilon squ uh, squared of two epsilon, that, that, that really that F of Z, Zn is the same as F of Zn star. So that's boundary condition. And then there is initial condition. And this boundary condition is really transformation of velocities. So I just want to pause and make a little analogy with quantum. With the quantum system, you start with the n body Schrodinger equation, you play with the Hamiltonian, that's your n body Schrodinger equation, and then you need to analyze it. In the classical, you have this Liouville equation, and in order to mimic the interaction of hard spheres if they are ternary, so what's happening, you have a transport in the interior, and then you are mimicking ternary interactions by imposing what's happening on the boundary, okay? For the hard spheres, at least. So then uh, how, do, how does that lead to ternary Boltzmann? So integrating by parts, so there is machinery now, there's some sort of type of program that one tries to do. Integrating by part Liouville equation, one derives a finite linear hierarchy of equations, and this is called BBGKY hierarchy. I'm not writing it for the sake of time. And by considering the number of particles going to infinity, we need to look at the new scaling now because we are talking about ternary interactions. So epsilon is the, uh, so what's happening here that epsilon and then number of particles, so epsilon is interaction zone if num number of particles and they're, they're related via n epsilon to the d minus one half is one. So then we get, uh, so we arrive at the infinite hierarchy of equations. So this is called Boltzmann hierarchy. So what's interesting is that the Boltzmann hierarchy admits factorized solutions if the factor solves this ternary Boltzmann equation. So finally here we are, the ternary Boltzmann, so on the left it's transport of F, on the right is Q3, and Q3 is related to what, of course, what the collisional law was for the interaction among three particles. So here I'm writing Q3, so it has a B star of F star, F star one, F star two, so there's a post-collisional here, you have pre-collisional, and the B, the kernel, is related to what was definition of the ternary interaction. So I want to tell you about this recent work on binary ternary. So let me see, I just, to wrap up the ternary picture. How, how do we pass from the, how do we do this limit rigorously? So we are guided by the program that was pioneered by Lanford and refined by Gallagher, Sandermon, and Texier uh, for deriving classical Boltzmann, and they use the Boltzmann grad scaling, which was relevant for the binary interactions. So, uh, however, by, gener by generalizing this program, we showed that the program is universal enough. However, it was not straightforward, far from trivial, because in order to make it applicable in our context, we actually had to in come up with some new mathematical arguments. And those mathematical arguments were related, after we have set up everything that I just mentioned, to going considering the limit from BBGKY to the Boltzmann hierarchy, convergence as n goes to infinity. And in order to show stability of good configurations, we needed to come up with some new geometric estimates, some spherical estimates, certain transition map, and certain ellipsoidal estimates. But since I really want to say at least a few things about this new work, I will stop talking about ternary, and I will move to talk about binary ternary. So Vlad, since I started a little bit late, can you please tell me the time until how many minutes do I have? Uh, so maybe um, six or seven more minutes. Thank you, that's, that's actually perfect, thank you. So now this is very recent work with Joachim and Petzogl. So we really want to go to the next step. We want to derive the equation, not just for ternary interactions, we want to derive the equation for binary and ternary interactions together. So in other words, we want to derive something like 2.20 with, of course, appropriate Q2 and Q3, which we will call binary ternary. So let me tell you about difficulties in this story, okay? So challenge number one, you want to detect, so before we read the slide, for a moment, ignore my slides, just think about it. You want to detect both binary and ternary interactions. So binary, so it's a little bit like playing with a microscope. So on one lens, you, you, you can see binary, and that's Boltzmann grad scaling as the number of particles goes to infinity. If you change the lens, you see the ternary interactions, but those are two different scalings. Now you would like to see both, so what do you do? 
So the first challenge is how do you detect both binary and ternary interactions? So by binary, we mean, we mean just the distance between Xi and Xj is epsilon. And by ternary, it's what, what definition that we use, that, for example, asymmetric version of the ternary distance. So crucial conceptual obstacle in this is incompat incompatibility of scalings. So boltzmann grad scaling is 2.21. So number of particles and the epsilon to the D minus one is one. And the ternary interaction is number of particles times epsilon to the D minus one half is one. Incompatible, okay? It's incompatible if you constrain yourself into thinking that epsilon should be the same. So really the solution out of this situation is it shouldn't be the same epsilon. So that's exactly what we do. So addressing the incompatibility of scalings, we overcome the problem by looking at the particles that the hard spheres, and they are indeed of diameter epsilon two, okay? But we allow them to interact in addition to binary interactions, we allow them to, that they can also interact as triplets via interaction zone of epsilon three. So then for the epsilon two, we impose the Boltzmann grad scaling. For the epsilon three, we impose the ternary scaling. And this, in, this in 2.23 implies that epsilon two is smaller than epsilon three, much smaller than epsilon three. So you have hard spheres whose radius is much smaller than what ternary interaction can be. Okay, so that's first obstacle. How do you detect them both? Then second obstacle is decoupling binary and ternary interaction. So what do I mean by that? You want to get Boltzmann equation that has binary and ternary term. And you need to figure out who produces binary term, who produces ternary term. You do not want to mix them all around because that's a complete mess. And they are mixed when you start. So our framework a priori allows that particles I and J interact as hard spheres. So that's binary interaction. And maybe at the same time, there is another particle K such that particle I interacts with J, with J and K. The picture is the best here, uh, the way, easiest way to see this. So you, a priori, it's allowed that particles I and J act as hard spheres and you have this just touching them. And then it's a priori possible that there is a particle K such that I, J, K in the ternary interaction. Yes, that is possible, but that's an enemy. That's an enemy that you need to fight because then this structure, does that produce binary? Does that produce ternary interaction? What's happening with this structure? So structure is there, okay? And you need to actually realize that pathological configurations, and this is not the only enemy, but pathological configurations, including the one above, are going to be shown to be negligible. And this is far from trivial, okay? So what will turn out to be the case is that because in part thanks to epsilon two being smaller than epsilon three, what will happen uh, only after certain probability uh, when you, re with a, you remove the pathological ones. So there will be pure binary, which is two particles interacted as, interacting as hard spheres while all other particles are not involved in any binary interaction. So when two particles interact, everything else is far away. So those guys are going to be responsible for producing Q2 in the nonlinear equation. And then there is a pure ternary interactions where three particles interact in a ternary distance epsilon three, but at, at the same time, none of the two subsets, when you look at the subsets of two, they do not interact as hard spheres. Of course, a priori, this is not known. So you have a bunch of combinatorial cases to consider and estimates to do in order to show that these are only two that survive. Okay, and uh, now challenge number three is stability of good configuration. And this is the hard, so first challenge number one, and challenge number one is a setup. So if you, you need to put the right setup because otherwise you cannot do anything. Challenge two is somehow you need to decouple them and that's happening throughout the proof. And challenge three is something that's always visible in the derivation of the kinetic equations. This is stability of good configuration. So. Uh, after, assume that you have a good configuration. By good configuration mean if you go run a backwards flow, uh, that that interaction doesn't run into any other interaction, okay? So assume that you have um, M particles. So here, I, I, I imagine that you, here I have a picture of M that are not visible, okay? And then you add sigma particles to the system. So from, uh, so you, sigma can be one or two, such that you have either binary or ternary interaction. So in my picture here, from the M particles, I'm representing only I, 
and then I'm adding two, which is m plus one and m plus two. So imagine you have m and you're representing i, and you have m plus one and m plus two. And imagine that you have a, you can now have a situation of either binary or ternary interaction when you add these two with the existing particle. On this picture, you have ternary interaction when you add two. So now backwards in time, you, under backwards time evolution, the system could run into another, either binary or ternary interaction. So the worst case scenario, the hardest one mathematically, is that when the newly formed ternary interaction runs backwards in time into binary interaction. And this is completely new because in the past, uh, when people looked at either binary interactions only, or when we looked at either ternary only, it was when you do backwards in time analysis, it was always the same type of interaction. Well, now we are faced with having a ternary interaction and the situation when you go backwards in time that you have binary. So this is the hardest one to exclude. And for that, we needed to now develop some novel geometric tools and algebraic tools. And since I don't have time, I'll spare us of details, but sort of this is sort of very ch serious uh, mathematical challenges along the way. So uh, I will stop actually here. I can tell if, if people know, I can tell about future works, but I think I will stop. I don't want to go much beyond the time. And I would like to thank you for your attention.